Hey, good morning, Parkway Church. My name is Pastor Dusty. I'm the pastor of Parkway Church. We're excited to have you here today for some worship and some teaching. I want to give you some announcements at the start of our morning here. And uh, this evening at 7.30 p.m., we are having our Parkway Church Summer Town Hall. This is an opportunity for you to Zoom in tonight. And we are going to pass on some great information uh, concerning church this summer into the fall. Uh, have some great things to announce to you, to pass on to you. And also give you an update, kind of a review. Our fiscal year within uh, the Wesleyan Church denomination uh, starts and ends in May. So we want to give you a little, just a review of celebrating some of the ministry that happened last year. Give you a financial update. Uh, typical town hall thing where you can ask some questions and give some input as well. So we want you to be part of that. If you're part of our directory, you already received an invite for that. If for some reason... Uh, you didn't get one, let us know. We'll get that to you this afternoon. We want you to be there 7.30 p.m. Uh, be an hour long, no longer. Uh, and we'd love to update you on some of those things. Great, great things ahead. Uh, I want to also let you know, Wednesday, June 23rd, school's out for summer. Uh, that afternoon, June 23rd, we are having a summer Zoom party uh, for Parkway kids. And June 30th at 7 p.m. is our next Parkway youth event over Zoom as well. We want you to tune into that if you get teenagers, kids. Check out our Facebook page, and uh, there'll be updates and announcements for those things as well. Grab a coffee, grab your Bible, tune in, and uh, take part in your household in some worship this morning, and then we'll dig into the Word afterwards. God bless you today. And I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough. Then you came along and put me back together. And every desire is now satisfied here in your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you there's nothing better than you lord there's nothing nothing is better than you and i'm not afraid to show you my weakness failures and flaws Lord you see them all and you still call me friend because the God of the mountain is the God of the valley and there's not a place where your mercy and grace won't find me again oh there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn morning to dancing, you give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory You're the only one who can You turn graves into gardens You turn bones into armies You turn seas into highways You're the only one who can Oh, there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you Oh, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Better than you, Lord, there's nothing Nothing is better than you. Mm -hmm. 
Let no one caught in sin remain Inside the lie of inward shame But fix our eyes upon the cross And run to Him who showed great love And bled for us Freely You've bled for us. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead, we are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. The weight of all our sin You bow to none but heaven's will No scheme of men, no scoffer's crown No burden great can hold you down In strength you reign Forever let your church Proclaim Christ is risen from the dead We are one with Him again Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the dead Christ is risen from the dead Trampled over death by death Come awake, come awake Come and rise up from the grave Don't death where is your sting? And oh, how? Where is your victory? And oh, the church, come stand in the light. The glory of God has defeated the night. Sing it, oh, death. Where is your sting? And oh, how? Where is your victory? You know, the church, come stand in the light. Our God is not dead, He's alive, He's alive. Christ is risen from the dead, trampling over death by death. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Christ is risen from the dead. We are one with Him again. Come awake, come awake, come and rise up from the grave. Jesus, we thank You that You rose from the grave, proving Yourself victorious over death, death and sin, proving that You are the Lord and Savior of each and every one of us. We thank you for your power to do that. Oh 
all the hearts who are content And all who feel unworthy And all who hurt with nothing left Will know that you are holy And all who will sing out Hallelujah, we will cry out Hallelujah Shall we do? Go on and scream it from the mountains Go on and tell it to the mountains is God and shall who do go on and scream it from the mountains go on and tell it to the masses that he is God Hey, welcome to part two of our Resurrected Relationship series, and I'm going to pray for us just at the start uh, of our teaching this morning, and I want to remind you before I do that, uh, all of the you know parts of the series, part one is available still on our YouTube channel, and we'll keep, they, they're going to follow on in, in succession in a meaningful way. Last week, as a foundation, if you missed last week, we really wanted to establish, before we get into uh, some of the guidelines of Scripture concerning relationships and how we should behave in them. 
uh, we sort of, as a starter last week, just reminded you uh, that these principles are great. They're inspired by the Holy Spirit, but we also have the Holy Spirit's power, his witness inside of us uh, to live this way. And as God speaks to you last week, this week, the coming weeks, on relationships in your life. Our prayer is that God would bring healing into your life, that God would speak to you, maybe concerning uh, a relationship in your life that uh, there's walls up in it, right? And, and things that are not going well, uh, that God would heal, that God would open up doors, that God would restore you into right relationships with people around you. And uh, you know, the scripture says we should try to live at peace with all men, with everyone around us. And uh, Hopefully, out of these next weeks will come moments of reaching out to somebody that you're estranged from, will come a moment of forgiveness, of forgiving someone uh, with, with the Holy Spirit's help that has wounded you, has brought wounding into your life. Maybe it'll give you creative thoughts uh, from the Holy Spirit to, to sort of breathe life into a relationship that's stagnated. And uh, that's the foundation of what we're doing. I'm going to pray for us that the Spirit meets with you today that way. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We read scripture. We see these principles that were inspired by your Holy Spirit. And these are not just uh, rules given to us. These are principles, God, that you uh, want to work in our hearts and minds uh, to be able to fulfill and live out by the power of your Holy Spirit. We need your Holy Spirit's power working in us today to bring healing, to bring truth into these areas of our lives, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So today's message, part two, it really is really simply today, kids and parents, all right? Kids and parents. Uh, how many of you were children once? That's everybody, right? This, is, this sort of applies to everybody. Uh, how many of you might be parents someday, maybe, right? There, there's so many things that apply to us at different stages of our lives here. And uh, important part to dig in. We're going to look at, at Ephesians 6 as we dig into the scriptures today. And uh, before I kind of start reading into the scripture, I want to let you know uh, if we could remind ourselves of this. And I know our past series, the Under Fire, Fire series, I, I reminded us the whole way through to read these epistles, these letters in the New Testament. Imagine them as being letters being read to a house church, a church in someone's household, everybody gathering around and reading the letter uh, written by one of the apostles and, and, and taking it in, talking about it afterwards. Wouldn't it be great if God restored some of that heart in our households where, where there was discussion afterwards, an opportunity to speak about the scripture as we, as we open it up. So you need to imagine entire families sitting in the same room and hearing this admonition in Ephesians that applied to the kids in the room, the teenagers in the room, the parents in the room. Uh, It applies to all of us in so many great ways today. Let me read the first verse, Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. The Greek word for obey, you know, it suggests complying or submitting to your parents And uh, this part of our scripture today very much applies uh, to the children in our household. And I want to be really careful before we dig in. Uh, This scripture, imagine in the context again, this letter being read out to a a house church and and being read in, read out to families who loved the Lord Jesus Christ, who Jesus was Lord in their home. This is sort of speaking into the best case scenario for potential. These are people filled with the Holy Spirit hearing this and going, yeah, that's how we should live as spirit-filled people in in these relationships. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. It makes sense to. It's funny, in our earliest days of development, we learn to respect our parents' voice even before we've even learned a lot of the English language, I was listening to one of uh, one of my nephews this week, and they have young children and uh, a young child that's learning to speak. And uh, hearing him speak to his daughter and just say, "Hey, wait, a I'll change the names for their sake." Hey there, Susie, look out, stay away from that. They know the tone of their father, mother's voice when they are about to get into trouble. We're sort of hardwired for this, aren't we? 
It saves us when we're little children. It saves us from getting hit by cars, <laughs> drinking poison, getting stung by bees. Uh, this relationship of just obeying our parents at a very fundamental level, it's, it's an incredibly human thing that God wired us to do. I want to tell you something about our brains. Listen to this. Though the brain... Y'all got brains, right? Yeah. <laughs> Though the brain may be growing in size, this is talking about our development, it does not finish developing and maturing until into our late 20s. I was talking with a, a, another youth pastor this week uh, who had been in youth ministry for a long time. I was a youth pastor for 17 years, and he had been in youth ministry for a long time, and we were talking about being youth pastors in our early 20s, right out of college, or right out of Bible college, and how at that age, we were probably a little bit more risky in some of the youth, the youth activities we were involved in, or what we took our kids on trips to be part of, things like that. And, and as I grew up, I remember some of those early days as a young youth pastor, some of the older youth leaders in our youth group, we'd go on a youth trip and they would remember things like, bring snacks for the kids, bring a first aid kit, things like that if you're going to play paintball, things like that, that, that our brains are not fully developed yet until into our, our mid to late 20s. The front part of our brain, called the prefrontal cortex, is one of the last brain regions to mature. This area is responsible for skills like planning, prioritizing, and controlling impulses. Because these skills are still developing, teenagers, if you have teenagers or if you are a teenager, listen up, teenagers are more likely to engage in risky behaviors without considering the potential results of their decisions. For this reason, <laughs> the obey your parents for this is right, it just makes sense to. Uh, for this reason, isn't it great to have somebody whose prefrontal cortex is developed <laughs> to try to encourage and give us advice when our prefrontal cortexes are not developed, right? To have somebody older to give you advice. I remember uh, getting my license when I was 18 and being a pretty like careful and responsible driver and being mom and dad, if you're listening today, I, I really was. <laughs> yeah, you're on the car on your own. And, and for the most part, really, you know, trying to do that, not doing 180 down the street, things like that. And I remember one time in particular, uh, what I felt like being stuck behind the snowplow on a highway back in New Brunswick by myself and stuck behind the snowplow going, oh, this guy's going too slow. I'm, I'm in a hurry. I need to get by this guy. And, and passing the snowplow and all of a sudden getting into not good roads and struggling to stay on the road and looking over at the snowplow driver as I was going by. And you could see the look in his eyes, right? Looking over going, dumb kid. Like just, just giving you that look, look of just disappointment of, you know, all of those things. Before that cortex is developed in us sometimes, risky decisions, behaviors that we're not sometimes thinking th about the results connected to. When you are living at home as children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Kids, if you're listening today, teenagers, Luke 2.51, it says that Jesus, this is a really interesting part of scripture, it says that Jesus was subject to his parents. Even Jesus, right, did this. Uh, as far as living in obedience and, and doing chores in his household, it's hard to imagine Jesus doing this, right? But, but helping, obeying all of these things. The scripture says in Lamentations 3.27, it is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is still young. It's good for us to be under discipline at a young age. Uh, I remember years ago at youth group, um, there was a girl at our youth group who, who sort of consistently was kind of bucking against the rules and not kind of want to, you know, the youth group would leave kind of game time and go to the sanctuary for worship or something like that. And she'd be outside and just consistently not kind of falling in with the rules. And it was sort of getting to the point where we we're like, are we going to have to like send this kid home? Or are we going to call her parents? And she's, she's not kind of submitting. And I remember sitting on the, on the, you know, the front step of the church, just talking to her for a little bit. And she just said, I don't know, know why we have any rules. My mom and I, I live with my mom, we're friends. There's no rules. We, we don't need all these rules around us. And it opened up a larger conversation of, of some of the bearing the yoke, like Lamentation says, when we, we are young, trains us for the fact 
that we will be under rules the rest of our lives, right? I remember saying to her like, hey, when you have your license someday and you're speeding and the cop pulls you over, the police officer pulls you over, you know, look him in the eye and say, you know, uh, look him in the eye and say, hey, you know, I I don't really believe in this rule, so I should be allowed to go. No, you're going to be under rules your whole life at your workplace, at your all sorts of things that we are going to have to submit to in our family life, in, in our church life, in our uh, governmental rules life. Uh, there, there is submission and discipline uh, the whole way along. Now, obviously, uh, I said it the first, this scripture applies to sort of the best case scenario, spirit-filled people that are living in their family life, how we should interact with each other. There are occasions, right? There are occasions where my obedience to Jesus Christ, I, I, I'm thinking of those extreme circumstances, right? Where parents are asking a child to do something that is contrary to what the Spirit of God would lead them to do, contrary to what Scripture would say. You know, there are moments uh, where, where, where some, there, there might be this extreme case where, where someone is being asked to do something wrong. This is not what this Scripture particularly is talking about. It's talking about living and thriving in that best, best case scenario. How many people want their family life to be the best that it can be? Amen? Like this is kind of where we're headed with this, to be the best that it can be. And kids, if you're getting bummed out that all the direction here <laughs> is, is for you, we're going to have some direction for parents in a little bit, all right? But, but obey your parents. This is a good thing. This is the right thing. Um, I, I was listening this week to, to Rick Warren talk about uh, this very scripture, Pastor Rick Warren in the States, and he said, of all of his years of counseling families, he discovered something really interesting, that sometimes even the most dysfunctional sort of parents or family situations that he was counseling in, oftentimes the parents, even though they were struggling to do good, they were struggling to, to do things well, they still really wanted the best for their children. And I've seen the exact same thing, right? Right? Of, of even teenagers at youth group coming out of really difficult family situations and sometimes meeting parents, they, they really genuinely, tearfully, most all of them, right? Even if they were struggling with addictions or struggling with different things, they really did want the best for their kids. They wanted better for their kids than what they were giving or what they were able to give. They really did want a lot for their kids. And your parents, uh, you know, you didn't, you didn't choose your parents. They're not perfect. And and scripture sort of exposes three authorities in our life uh, that will have to be honored in in the home, the church, and in government. And uh, that respect of that authority and and obedience within a, a household. In our present culture, there seems to be this trend right now, especially in the West, right? towards if you are, and I don't say this, if you're a teenager listening this morning, I'm not saying it in a mean way to you, but sort of this trend towards if you're 16, it means you're liberated and you're the most thoughtful about the things in the world and you've got it right. And we need to throw off the shackles of all these out of date sort of institutions and thoughts and laws around us. And, and boy, don't we value the energy of youth. We value new ideas. We absolutely do. But scripture talks about the wisdom of someone that is older than us and more experienced than us, that has followed Jesus Christ longer than us. The scripture says if we walk with the wise, very simply, we will become wise as well. Proverbs 16.31 says this, gray hair is a crown of splendor. Now in your household today, if you have somebody with gray hair, look over and say, That's a crown of splendor. Give give them a look. Gray or white hair, look over and say, they have a crown of splendor. It's the scripture's way of kind of saying, the oldest one in the village is to be the most respected and honored. Cultures through the centuries have been good at this, even though it's sort of a lost art in our day. Uh, If you think about 2,000 years ago, the man or woman in the village who was the oldest had the most life experience behind them, the most knowledge about the crops around them, the most knowledge about kids being raised around them. What they knew was invaluable and difficult and hard days. Some places around the world, this respect still exists. I was watching a travel show the other day and it was, it was exposing and, and talking with some of the culture in a Scandinavian country, a Scandinavian country where they sort of joke that there's one sauna for every three people or something. It's one of those kind of places. And they were, they were talking about 
sauna etiquette. And, and he gave this image of maybe 10 men sitting in the sauna. I know in, in North America, business deals are, are done on golf courses, right? In other places around, they're done other places. He said people sitting in the sauna and talking about work or life or things like this. And, and there was a, there's a tradition sort of in that culture of uh, the, the, the oldest man in the room getting the best seat at the sauna. And if somebody new enters the sauna, that a younger person would get up and give the oldest man the seat at the sauna. There's a, there's a neat story and the, the travel guide told the story of, of an elderly man entering into the sauna and the prime minister was in the sauna. And there was this awkward moment of sort of respect, who deserves the most respect, what should we do? And, and the prime minister getting up from his seat and giving, giving the sauna over to the elderly man that, that came in. This type of respect is, is sometimes sort of a lost thing in our culture. And I think, boy, we're gonna get onto it in a second when we talk about honoring your father and mother, but this area of obedience from a young age it blossoms in later when we get to verse two, into honor uh, towards our parents. I love this quote. It used to sit on my desk at our previous church, uh, George Washington Carver. I have found this to be true in this area of obedience and honor. Boy, tune it. this is a great thought. This is what he said. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving and tolerant of the weak and the strong because someday in your life you will have been all of these at some point in your life you will have been all of these young aged striving weak strong you will be all of these things at some point in your life scripture really plainly says you do under others as, as you would want to have done to you. Treat other people as you would like to be treated. You will be in this situation someday. And doesn't it show something in your character, right? Um, how we treat those that are older or in authority over us. We may be in that position someday. How will we want people that are younger than us to treat us? Uh, the Absolute wisdom in this. Absolute wisdom in this. Ephesians 6, 2 says this. So we, we're moving on from sort of infancy and teenagerhood into the rest of our lives, right? There may come a time in future if you are at home still and in high school or a kid or whatever, where you will leave the nest and you will no longer sort of be under this obedience. Uh, you're, you're creating a new life, a new family. You're no longer under the roof of the household and uh, the obey part may not be, it won't be part of your, your normal day, but the honor your father and mother is for all of us for the rest of our lives. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise so that it may go well with you. This is a really interesting thought out of scripture. So that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Honor your father and mother. Now, I've seen this happen my times in youth ministry, just life. I've seen this happen a lot of times where, where teenagers might be at war with their parents, right? And then years later when they have their own families, sort of this aha moment happening, right? Of going like, wow, it's really hard to be a parent. I should be more thankful of what my parents tried to give me or tried to do for me. There's this neat little Neat little thought here I read this week. It's really great. This is, what, this is what it is. It says, this is the 10 stages of motherhood. Listen up. 10 stages of motherhood. At age four, a child says this, my mommy can do anything. At eight, my mom knows a lot, a whole lot. At 12, my mom doesn't really know quite everything. At 14, mom doesn't know that either. At 16, mom She's hopelessly old-fashioned. At 18, <laughs> that old woman, she's out of date. At 25, mom might actually know a little bit about it. At 35, at 35 years old, before we decide, let's get mom, mom's opinion. At 45, <laughs> I wonder what mom would have thought about this. And at 65, listen to this, a little perspective today. At 65, I wish I could talk it over with my mom. And hopefully, in the best case scenario, as God leads you, 
you can move past that obedience stage. You've, you've moved on from your family of origin and move on from obedience to this area of honor uh, towards your father and mother. How do we honor them? I think, boy, be really careful when I think about honoring somebody. Be really careful not to bring them into public disrepute. We talked about this a week before, but the gospel is the hardest to live out in your household, right? You can fake it around town with your friends or your, the people you work with, but the people that are in the same house of, as you, they see every good and bad part of you. They, they see that sin nature displayed more than anyone else. We're privy to that in the lives of our parents, right? Don't bring them into public disrepute. Share the best of them with other people. Be thankful for them. How many kids often struggle to understand their parents until they have their own children? The difficulties, the sleepless nights, the empty wallets, and something, this issue of honor, understanding where you came from and where those parents came from and honoring, it seems to give perspective on where we're going. Years ago, um, a father of a, of a teenager at her youth group, he had, had, had gone through terrible difficulties in his life leading up to being a father. Um, addictions, abuse, all sorts of things leading up. And had sort of lived this wild and crazy life and had come to Jesus and is raising a teenager. And I remember him looking me in the eye one time and just saying this, saying, I, I don't feel like I'm giving anything good to my, to my son. Like he, he looked back on his life that, was, that felt wasted and difficult and challenged troubles and troubles caused by him, troubles caused by others. And, and, and just sort of the wildness he came out of and he says, I, I don't know what I'm giving my son right now. And, and I want to tell you, that understanding with his son, that connection, I remember looking at him in the eye and go, listen, you're, you're the turnaround in the history of your family. Think what would have happened if you had just continued on and not come to Christ and not decided to be, want to be a great father and do the best you can. Think what would have happened if you hadn't, if you, if you just continued on that, that dark path, right, before you had come to Christ. The turnaround generation always has it the hardest, right, of undoing all these bad sort of things put on you and moving forward and trying to lead your family in this way. It matters, mom and dad. Boy, it matters to lead your family. And it was interesting how understanding that teenage boy was of his father's background. Like once he understood how forgiving, you know, naturally people, we forget this sometimes how forgiving our kids are, parents, right? When we actually are honest, you know, how forgiving they are. Understanding where he came from was part of this honoring, right? I, 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 you know, some of the, the baggage and hard stuff that of this father's life not good, right? But I can at least understand where he's coming from. It would give me honor for him to say, wow, he's trying to turn things around. He's trying to make a difference. What a beautiful thing. Rich Mullins, the Christian songwriter, awesome God, uh, sometimes by step in his biography, he talks about this looking back into his parents' past and trying to honor them, trying to understand them. He said he came to this place where he realized how his dad felt about farming is how he felt about music. It helped him just understand that his father saw beauty in those things, even though they were so different. Understanding those backgrounds and where they were coming from allowed him to honor his father in a deeper way and be thankful uh, for his father. How do we honor them? Praise, praise and thankfulness uh, for the good that they are. A perfect parent, listen to this, this is neat. A perfect parent is a person with excellent child-rearing theories and no actual children. <laughs> That's by Dave, Dave Barry. Uh, yeah, there, there's no perfect parents, but by the grace of God, uh, would he help us? Uh, would he help us to parent like Jesus would? To parent like Jesus would. I read a stat this week. The average kid, this is good for teenagers for you to hear, by the time you were 18, you will have cost, and this is in US dollars, you will have cost your parents about $250,000 by average. A parent is someone who has photos instead of money. <laughs> that's, that's a great, great quote I heard this, this week as well. Um, every parent is flawed. Every child and teenager is flawed. But we're called to honor this position. 
they brought us into the world. You know, how many people heard this when you were young from your father? I brought you into the world. I can take you out of it. Yeah, they brought us into this world. They provided for us. They trained us up as best they could. And uh, mom and dad, I'm so thankful for you. I honor you today. And uh, why don't you find a way to honor your parents today? Thank you so much for all that you've done. Verse 4, Ephesians 6, 4 says this. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. That word is interesting. Don't exasperate your children. Another translation of the scripture says, don't, don't provoke your children to wrath. <laughs> really neat. I was reading, a, reading, a, uh, uh, reading notes from a seminar this week, and the, the one that was doing the seminar on parenting said this, that he asked each mom and dad in the seminar to pull out their cell phone and text this question to their teenager. Do you think that I expect you to be perfect? That was the question they were supposed to send out to their teenager. After about five minutes, every phone in the auditorium started beeping with replies. About 95% of the teenagers said that they believed that their parents wanted them to be perfect. Have you seen this happen before? Where this word exasperate, where parents are, are putting loads on their kids that Jesus would not put on them. Now, boy, there's lots of evidence in Scripture that as parents, we're supposed to discipline our kids for their godliness, for their growth as human beings, to help them be productive uh, members of societies, to be hardworking, to be honest. All of these traits are good things. But above and beyond that, and this is a good question to ask Jesus today, really honestly, Am I putting a a load on my child that Jesus does not want me to? Am I exasperating them? You know, Jesus in his criticism of the Pharisees said, they tie up heavy loads on people's back and do nothing to help them, right? Are we doing this in some ways? Are we holding them to standards that we're not even holding ourselves to? It's a reminder sometimes, you know, on a really simple way. You know, when, when, it, when a child spills a drink on a carpet or breaks a, a, an ornament, a, a relic in your household, that we have done these, we did the same things when we were kids. And as adults, we do the same thing, right? That, that we, we trip, we make mistakes. We, are we holding our kids to maybe levels of expectation that are exasperating for them? They're exasperating for them. And uh, I, I've seen this, you know, Time and time again, where, where sometimes a, a mom or a dad, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to make their son into a football player, but he's just into something very different. And there's this wedge in their life, and, and they're trying to make them into something that maybe Jesus is, is, is not trying to make them into. And uh, would the Lord help us, right? Would the Lord help us to see our kids and kids see your parents as Jesus sees them? I've seen an equally sort of dangerous thing sometimes when when parents are sometimes trying to pass on the principles of Christianity and and not really passing on a relationship with Jesus to their kids at all. You know, it's sort of like I I want my kids to be Christians, but I don't love Christ. And I I know that sounds crazy when we say it out loud like that, but, but if all it is is just sort of a set of rules there's a whole generation of kids that are going to maybe keep some of those rules, but have nothing to do with Jesus afterwards. And uh, boy, every teenager that goes astray or goes weary, it gets off track, right? They often, they often do get to this place in their life where, where they, 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 they look back in, in a good way, where they're able to see that their parents are genuinely praying for them, right? You hear the stories of the testimony. I, I was rebelling, I was going off track, and I'd walk by my parents' room and I'd see my mother down on her knees praying for us every evening. There was a relationship, there was a relationship that they were witnessing, and it was powerful. There's a neat little thought here. You can teach them, your kids, you can teach them what you know. Boy, this is, this is convicting. You can teach them what you know, but you will reproduce what you are. Did you hear that? You can teach them what you know, but you will reproduce what you are. 
There was a study done, uh, uh, this is by Warren Muller years ago, about church attendance. And I know this is different right now. Like during this COVID season, it's challenging, right? They're, they're, we look forward to the day, by the way. We're excited for it. When we can get up in the morning with our kids, get them ready to church, go to church, leave them at a kids program where they're getting trained and taught and all these good things happen. You can grab a coffee and sit in service and there'll be a, ah, uh, and there, there really can be a break. You can be engaged in worship and be an, ad, be an adult conversation, right? Parents, it's a good thing. We look forward to these days again. I know at home, you are sometimes Sunday morning, it, it is more work maybe of, of pulling your family in. There's so many distractions. Be part of Parkway Kids TV, right? The consistency of this. Be part of service. Talk to your kids. Open up the scripture together after service. Pray together. That intentionality about the day still mattering. There was a study done uh, years ago that said this. If both mom and dad attend church regularly, 72% of their children will remain faithful in attendance afterwards. If only dad attends regularly, 55% remain faithful. If only mom attends regularly, 15% remain faithful. If neither attend regularly, only 6% remain faithful. It speaks to a consistent pattern in our lives, mom and dad, of knowing Jesus Christ and leading in our families, and leading, intentional about following Jesus Christ. Intentional in following Jesus Christ. And I want to really challenge you, uh, two challenges today. If you're a teenager or a kid listening to this today, um, you know, you, you are in this family, you have an opportunity uh, to honor your parents, to appreciate them, to be helpful, to, to do the chores that you're asked to do. They're not fun sometimes, right? They're, there's all these things that, that we're getting trained at when we're younger that are difficult. We don't always agree with our parents about what that training should be like. In the rest of your life, you will be under some rules that don't make sense. And I, we obey them out of respect and honor for the governmental authorities over, or authorities in our workplaces, all of these things are good and meaningful. You may be a child or a teenager today and you really are struggling and we, we open this up for you. Like you really are in a place where there are people in authority over you that are asking you to do evil things, right? You are in a really hard place right now. And we're going to talk about this, this next week, but the scripture says, that God will be a father to the fatherless, that you can call on him and reach out to him right now and say, God, how, how should I act? What should I do in this situation? It's so beyond me. How do I act? You're in an unsafe place. You reach out for help. You, you call the police if it's those type of things, right? You're in a terrible situation this way, that God would help you make right decisions as you pray, right? And reach out for help. That's obviously an extreme case that would probably not be most of the, the listeners today. And in those other cases, what does it mean to honor your parents and respect them that it would go well for you the rest of your life, that it would set a pattern of respect that breeds respect, that breeds respect and honor, that there would be something that passes down the line. And for parents today, would there be a cry in your heart to say, what does it mean for me to lead in my household and, and show my kids my relationship with Jesus Christ and to be consistent and to not exasperate my kids with things that Jesus Christ would not exasperate them with. You can teach them what you know, but you will reproduce what you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for your word. I, I, I see the scripture. The reason it's written down is because we struggle to do these things. As parents, there will be moments where there is enormous, enormous temptation to be exasperating towards our kids. We've done it before. We've had long days, hard days, and we've been frustrated. We've been short with our kids. We've been over the top sometimes putting things on them that we don't need to. And, and as kids and teenagers, uh, we, we've been really, boy, disrespecting, uh, dishonoring to the parents, God, that you've given us. And Father, would you work in us to honor properly this week? And obey, even when it's difficult. 
And God, for maybe a a kid or a teenager here today that really is in a situation, if there is one listening today, would you give them courage, God, if they're in an unsafe situation where uh, their parents are, are, or whoever is in authority over them is not acting properly to them or is asking them to do things that are wrong, would you give them real courage to reach out to someone for help today? If it's a, a neighbor or uh, a friend, uh, the authorities, the police authorities above us, God, would you give them courage to do that? In Jesus' name, amen. We want to walk with you on this journey, and we want to offer you counsel. If you are in a, a, a hard situation within your family life right now, we can provide some counsel for you. We can refer you to some counsel, but God wants, boy, peace, love, joy, patience, gentleness, self-control within our families, right? As people are, that are filled with the Holy Spirit are living together, and if we can help you along that journey, we, we want to. So make sure you let us know if there's anything we can help with that way. You can contact our office. And, and let us know. God bless you today. Excited to dig in next week. Uh, the furious love of God the Father. That's our, that's our topic next week. Excited to share the word with you. Tune in and keep uh, following along with us. God bless you today.